Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the See and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. I'll hold back on political and religious statements. (laughs) Uh, yeah, that, that, why don't we start <laughs> there? Okay. Anyway, so. <laughs> okay. Um, it's interesting. I would love to have those conversations. Uh, but, and I've always been told like, stay away from those things. Right. And I used to say, bung, bung, you know, like whatever, like we're all mature adults. We can have a great conversation yeah. <laughs> over the last several years. I realized that's not the case. And, um, and sadly, even among artists and, and people who like to explore ideas. Um, I find it tremendously sad that today we can't have open conversations because everyone gets so offended so yeah. quickly that then they think because they're offended, they have the right to go and jeopardize your income by, you know, trying to get you fired or, you know, mm-hmm. coming against you or, you know, it just turns into this total grown-up version of monkeys throwing crap at each other it's just disgusting right yeah i totally agree and you know it's it's kind of sad that there's no real conversation possible yep. anymore without everybody either getting personal or everybody taking stuff personal that wasn't simply because you didn't agree with them so i yeah, yeah. And you know what i i sort of try to keep those things out of my art anyways you know my art is supposed to make happy Mm -hmm. um rather than me digesting stuff through my art you know for me it's sort of my retreat when i start painting everything else stops and i love that about it i think that's why i'm so addicted to it (laughs) (laughs) that's so beautiful i love how you put that because when i look at your work i i see that i you know some some artists when they paint they're so focused on the, let's call it their reference that ultimately they just copy the reference. Right. And oftentimes the reference comes from a photo. And if the photo, if the photographer who took it isn't an artist and he's just clicking a little button to capture an image, Mm -hmm. then too many times the image that's painted feels like the photo, which is frozen. It's frozen in time. Um, and that's very, very different than an artist like yourself who has this still moment in time. There's a, right. there's a total difference. And um, the, the frozen one lacks life. The Being still, there's still an incredible amount of life and animation in that moment. Um, mm-hmm. But you just feel still like, you're, like you've got to glimpse into, into this private moment. Right. Mm. And, you know, I I think there's also a difference if you work from, I mean, I personally, I prefer to work from life. Mm -hmm. Um, So either on plein air when I go outside on location um, or I set up uh, my own little still life setups in my studio simply because I can see the colors better. You know, Mm -hmm. photographs, they warp everything. You know, the lights are too light and the shadows are too dark and too blue. And, I don't have the patience to alter pictures in Photoshop so that they're exactly the way I would want to paint it. You know, I know, how, I know how to make it up working from a photograph, but I think the difference when you work from your own photograph, you still remember what you felt. You know, there was something yeah. about the scene that made you take that photograph in the first place. And you don't have that when you work from somebody else's photograph. And, you know, I also noticed that I have a huge idea folder Mm. and if I wait 
too long to to paint something that is in that idea folder, it just fizzles out. You know, I look at stuff mm. that I photographed last year. I look at it and I'm like, but what is it even that grabbed me? I don't remember. And I delete it because I don't want to paint it anymore. And, you know, it's funny because my mom sometimes sends me pictures she found in a magazine or in a newspaper. And she's like, oh, that, look how cute that is. You should paint that. And I look at it and I feel absolutely nothing. Wow. <laughs> There's no excitement. So I, I think, you know, you really have to pick what you what you want to paint yourself and not just find somebody else's work, you know, in form of a photograph um, and work with that. I, I don't know. Personally, for me, that just doesn't do it. <laughs> well, I I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Um, so do so do you work right now currently um, primarily in plain air or do you do a lot of still lives? Like, like how do you do your, your work? Um, so right now, um, so I took two weeks off, you know, I brought my gouache on a little vacation to, to Italy, which was mm. a family vacation. And I ended up painting only once. And even then my heart wasn't really into it. Mm. And it sort of felt good to, not paint for a while because I've been incredibly busy for the, you know, the beginning of the year. Um, but now I'm actually going to work the next couple of days on a series of food paintings for um, a food show, a local food show at the cultural council in Lake Worth here in Florida. Mm -hmm. And um, those are going to be studio paintings, but they're also going to paint, be painted from life. So I'm, you know, it's funny when I go to the, to the grocery store, you know, I don't go in there, you know, basically buying food that looks good to eat. <laughs> I walk through there and I'm like, Ooh, look at all the subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll paint that and I'll paint look, that. Look, look, that is so paintable right there. You know, <laughs> And it was actually kind of gross. Recently, I, I painted a painting of um, oysters. Uh -huh. And so I had gone, bought myself oysters, ate half of it <laughs> right away, and then painted the other half. And I, I now know why oysters are always meant to be kept on ice. Because after three hours, you know, after two hours, I started to get a little whiff of something. <laughs> after three hours, it was just brutal. And I decided, okay, painting's done. That's it. <laughs> wow. One of them actually started to blow little bubbles. I mean, they're still alive when you, when you open them, you know. Oh, wow. And so that was kind of gross. But, yeah, so I'm going to be painting. <laughs> um food for a couple of days and uh -huh. then probably towards the end of next week i'm gonna head up uh, to fisher's island mm -hmm. which is a little island i think technically it's the state of new york but it's kind of wedged in between the northern tip of long island and connecticut and you get there by boat wow and there's a gallery there. It's called Pandion Gallery, and they're throwing me a solo show. Wow. And the gallerist said that she wanted mostly paintings that had a local flavor, you know, something the locals can relate mm -hmm. to. And the oyster painting was actually for that show because they have oysters up there. And, you know, I've never been up there, so I painted 11 paintings where I'm like, okay, you know, seagulls i'm sure they have seagulls i painted seagulls but i also told her i would like to come and do four or five paintings en plein air on location mm -hmm. and the gallerist was so nice her name is Di diana Sargent, and she invited me to stay with her at her house so that i could paint for a couple of days wow that is all gonna be um plein air and so right now I'm just watching the weather. And when I see that there's going to be a stretch of a couple of nice days, I'm going to book myself a flight and head up there. Nice. Nice. Wow. That's so cool. That's yeah. so cool. And, mm -hmm. and then I have a, another show, a two person show in October and I still want to do a couple of fresh new paintings for that show too. And I haven't decided yet what I'm going to do. You know, it's, um, Lately, I've gotten into shiny things. You know, I go through phases. <laughs> <laughs> and lately, it's been shiny things. So I have a couple of little, tiny little um, baby shoes from my niece. And mm -hmm. she has those adorable, shiny little 
patent leather Mary Jane. So I've painted a couple of those from life. You know, I just set them up in my studio and I, I usually, there's not a lot of conscious symbolism in my paintings, but with these little shiny shoes, I feel differently about it because those are the shoes, you know, she's taking her first steps in and who knows where the whole journey you know, will take her someday and mm-hmm. how much fun she's going to have buying shoes when she's a grown up, if she has any of my DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Which is woman DNA. Exactly. Um, uh-oh, I just, I'm a sexist. I, I, I. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily a woman thing. So my dad, for instance, you know, he has been to the war in Germany and all that and, you know, was very poor and, didn't have anything and um when he was finally working and was done with his education and and made money he would spend a lot of money on shoes he had this thing for beautiful shoes Mm. and uh, i think it was because he didn't have them when he was young so it's really not women it's men too and i noticed that in italy too the italian men and their shoes oh my (laughs) god When I, when I lived in uh, Portugal, I got in a little habit. I probably bought more shoes in Portugal than I probably bought in my entire life. Um, I, where I was staying right around the corner was a shoe store. And uh, it was just crazy because of everything being so cheap there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I put on an outfit. I'm like, man, these shoes don't don't match. Like, they don't really – I decided to walk – I walk around the corner and like buy a new pair of shoes and uh, like, yeah. And I, and I did that enough where I was like, Oh, this is what they're talking about. Like it it almost became slightly addicting, uh, addictive. It was, it was. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it makes your whole outfit, you know, it's, it's actually, you know, because my dad always had these beautiful shoes, you know, I don't know if it's just, you know, because I'm a woman that I love beautiful shoes or if, if it's my dad's jeans that I have. But I, it's my pet peeve when I see a gentleman beautifully dressed, looking really nicely and then messing it all up with the wrong shoes, you know, like the healthy kind with the rubber soles. I'm like, oh, come on, you know, a nice pair of leather shoes would be so much better. <laughs> well, they would they would agree, but I think most men are like, I just need like either a pair of sneakers or and a dress shoes. <laughs> like, <laughs> and if you're if you if you're working like in construction or something, then you need some construction boots, you know. But mm-hmm. um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I shoes are pretty cool, pretty cool. I, I'd love to find a designer and one day have custom shoes made. One day, I, I would love yeah. to be part of that process. Um, but. So you, you know, know I, I know we're getting off here on a tangent, but have you seen those? I think they're, they're called uh, Flukov. They're no. the coolest shoes. They make them in Seattle. You know what? If, I have to look it up. I, I'm not clear on the name right now, but I, I will send you a message later. <laughs> okay. And you have to check them out because they have really cool shoes for men and women. <laughs> And so when you were in Italy, besides looking at the shoes, normally uh, we have this conversation at the end of this uh, conversation, uh, podcast, but we're going to do it this time up in the beginning because, um, uh, eh, you yeah, know, there's nothing wrong with spicing up. And we've been talking about food anyway. So when you were in, in Italy and you weren't looking at people's shoes, um, talk to me about the experience with the food there oh where to start the food is the best you know i i uh i actually you know i'm I'm sort of a cheese addict so Mm -hmm. if you put sweets in front of me or cheese i would go for the cheese and one of my best birthday cakes was actually a couple of years ago when i was in paris with my daughter over my birthday and instead of a birthday cake she had bought me this little goat cheese that she Mm -hmm. had carried around in her backpack in the heat all day the day before so it was kind of squishy and shapeless and she just stuck a match into the top for a candle because she didn't have a candle 
I loved it. That's awesome. <laughs> goat cheese, goat cheese um, a birthday cake. No, but uh, so I'm a cheese addict. And when we were on the Amalfi Coast, I actually learned how to make mozzarella. Mm -hmm. So we found this cheesemaker um, whose family has made cheeses for 200 years. And he's wow. still in the original building that used to be a church. His name was um, Biagio. Yeah, that was in Ravello. And so my husband, my daughter, and I, we got to make cheese with him. You know, and it was so interesting. I have even more appreciation for cheese now because the poor guy gets up at three o'clock every morning to make his, his mozzarella. You know, the, you, wow. it only, it only um, keeps for about three days, so you have to make it fresh all the time. And speaking of, you know, birthdays and so on, a lot of Italians actually have him at their special celebrations. Like he does a lot of weddings where he makes mozzarella on location and people can eat it right there. Wow. The guy can actually make, you know, I, I asked him how many mozzarella balls do you make every morning? He didn't really answer that. But he said to me, I think he thought the question was about speed. The question was really about volume, but he told me that um, when he does weddings, he makes those tiny mozzarella balls um, and he makes 800 tiny mozzarella balls in 20 minutes. In 20 minutes? I can't yes. even count that. <laughs> I can't even count the 800 in 20 minutes. It's like, you know, two <laughs> seconds for, for one little mozzarella ball. So, yeah, that was really interesting, you know, to see how that works. And I actually went on Amazon and bought myself this mozzarella making kit. Mm -hmm. I'm going to attempt to make it myself. And the other addiction I have is um, the limoncello there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Amalfi Coast is famous for its lemons. They mm -hmm. have... Um, different kinds there and you know they're also famous for their what's it called i think it's called majolica you know the painting on the tiles mm -hmm. and on on the ceramics it's mostly lemons you know the lemons everywhere and um so i drank a lot of limoncello and i'm gonna make my own limoncello here at home because i got a recipe from a real italian and he told me exactly how to make it and um, another thing that I got to try that I had never tried before, never had never heard about is it's called colatura. It's actually, it's anchovy juice, basically. Okay. So <laughs> in, in Chetare, which is this little fishing town uh, on the Amalfi Coast, they, mm -hmm. they catch a lot of sardines and they turn them into anchovy. And it, basically the anchovy, they're, they're sitting there in their salty brine for a really long time. And I think they're putting olive oil into, into it and whatnot. And the drippings, they catch the drippings from that. And that is basically concentrated anchovy juice. And they put it on pasta. They, took, they put it on bruschetta. I even had a martini with it. You know, it was a dirty martini. And they had put a little a couple of drops. It's very intense a couple of drops of the colatura into the martini. And I'm like, wow, wow. <laughs> it's delicious. So yeah, you know, I mean, food is really, really important to the Italians and to me too. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, my mom was always a good cook and I didn't really learn how to cook until I got married. Mm -hmm. And then it was more out of necessity because, you know, we, we had to eat something. My husband likes to cook too. And it's really just by following good recipes. Um, and I keep those, you know, I, I, you, you will rarely eat the same dish twice in my house because I'm constantly trying new recipes. I love to try new recipes. That's and then we sit down and eat and then we vote. We're like, keeper or not. And if it's <laughs> keeper, I'll put it in my folder. And if not, you know, it gets ditched. And um, yeah, the Italians, you know, they, I mean, it's the... Naples is the birthplace of pizza and then the the uh, the Amalfi Coast birthplace of mozzarella and you know also the food in Rome I mean it's everywhere you can always get something to eat somewhere but we also had a really good lunch in Ravello um, it was not the typical Italian cuisine that you would find in a regular Italian restaurant it was just 
a little bit out of the ordinary, like um, the incorporation of the lemons. You know, I, mm. I had I had this pasta dish. It was almost a little bit like a lasagna with ricotta in it, but they had put the lemon into that ricotta and yeah. it was really nice and foamy. Oh my God, it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> and of course i also like to paint food you know in general i i like to paint what i like i i don't really think much about what might sell mm-hmm. um because every time i've painted a painting thinking oh that actually turned out nicely you know that that would probably sell pretty fast and I, I, I'm still sitting on these and mm-hmm. other things where I didn't think of, you know, what might sell. And I'm just, ooh, you know, look how beautiful the light is on that. I'm painting it and they're flying off the wall. So I, I, I stopped thinking about, you know, what other people might like because you just don't know. And so, you know, when I paint food, it could be anything from donuts to, mm. you know, fruit. I've painted sushi. I've painted the oysters um cupcakes um you know all, all kinds of different things i think i'm going to i'm going to paint some um eggs sunny side up for that food show that i have coming up <laughs> um maybe with bacon i could even make it look like a little face you know like with two eggs and maybe the bacon strip like a mouth <laughs> no so we'll see <laughs> yeah <laughs> everything was cool you said, everything you said was so cool up to that moment <laughs> <laughs> sorry did i spoil it <laughs> yeah i'm not sure which is worse the uh, smiley face with a bacon smile or uh bubble blowing oysters yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you you could not imagine the smell it was so bad so you're 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 both french and german correct no, I'm just German. It's just and you're my just name. German. Your name is French. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that's cool. That's cool. And did you learn uh, how to draw and paint in Germany? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Not the painting part, but definitely some drawing. So, you know, my theory is um, that when you have that creativity, you're just born with it. You know, I, I, because... Whenever you know, I know another a, a lot of other artists, and they all have one thing in common. They had that creative urge from a very early age on, even mm-hmm. if they didn't follow up on it until later. You know, a lot of people, including myself, you know, they started out doing something else, but that urge it's still in there, and at some point it just wants to come out. And so, you know, I've always you know, when I was a kid, I was always creative, not just necessarily painting and drawing, but also building stuff. You know, I, I love doing with stuff with my hands, you know, building stuff. And I would create these huge um, spider webs in rooms with string. It would drive my mom nuts because she <laughs> would open the door and, you know, all she could see was string spun all over the room. Um, and then... Uh, you know, I, I ended up not studying art because my dad gave me, you know, I think it was it was uh, good advice. He said, oh, you know, you should learn something where you can make money in whatever country you'll end up in, which was sort of hmm. weird because it was almost like he already had a gut feeling that I wouldn't stay in Germany. So I got my um, MBA and I ended up working for a bank. Hmm. And I was bored out of my mind studying economics and all the math and statistics and all that. And I, w- I actually survived by drawing comics. What? I was very much into cartooning. And so I drew, you know, all my professors, you know, everybody got turned into cartoons. And my, my husband still actually has some of them because we, we actually went to university together. Oh, and, um, and then... Uh, it was actually after we moved to the States. You know, I, I did take classes. You know, I, I took some figurative drawing classes back in Germany, you know, night classes and so on, just because I needed some sort of outlet for, for the creativity. 
especially since I had to do with so many numbers, which is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, when we moved to the States, um, I had a natural break in my career anyways. And um, I don't know, one thing just led to another and I started a mural career. Um, you know, I got pregnant. We had a beautiful daughter who's an artist too. Um, she's at the School of the Art, Art Institute of Chicago she's a senior there now and she's doing animation but anyway so so when I got pregnant with her I decided to paint murals on the nursery and had so much fun that later you know over the course of the next couple of years I, I ended up painting murals all over our house and people would see it and uh, would want it too so uh, a business was born you know I never had to advertise but people would just either see stuff in my own house or then in other people's houses and wanted some murals too. So I did that for 11 years while we lived wow. in Chicago. And then we moved to San Francisco. And that's really when the stars all aligned. You know, it was interesting in retrospect when you look back at stuff. Um, I found this fabulous mm -hmm. tiny atelier Mm -hmm. um, where you could learn how to paint. And I knew exactly what style I wanted to paint in, you know, loose, impressionistic, with beautiful color uh, and thick paint. And uh, we had just moved to the area. And in this little local paper, I found a tiny little ad. I mean, it was probably like two inches by an inch. And it was an ad for the little art school and I cut it out and it was lying on my desk in the office for several months before I came across it again. And I decided to call them and that was the beginning of a total, you know, studying with those two women at that art school just opened up a new world. That's where it all started. You know, that, what that school we was it? There. It's called Marin Art School. And um, it's led by um, Darlin Davis and Jane Heafy. And I'll be forever grateful for every, mm. everything they taught me because it's interesting. You know, it's not like um, college where you take art classes. Um, they start you from the beginning. And mm. in the beginning, it was a little bit of a hit to my ego because I thought <laughs> I knew how to do things. And, you know, I had painted my murals and whatnot. And they start you with charcoal. They have you draw boxes. Um, they, they teach you about perspective. And only then they start you with value still in charcoal. When you get the value, then you're ready to move on to oil paint, but only black and white. So for a really long time, you're only going to do black and white studies. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when they feel you got a grasp of value, they give you a few colors. You know, they start you out with a very limited palette. And as you get ready for it, they will add um, colors to your palette so that you basically have a split primary palette you know cool and a warm of the primary colors and then and everything is from life you know everybody had their own little still life set up it was very individualized you know they would work with everyone at their own level mm -hmm. and then when you were ready with that they would take you outside and paint on plein air and they taught me really most of what i know and they also taught me how to teach because I, I teach classes too. And I really loved, um, you know, I think my numbers background uh, turned me into a little bit more of an analytical person. Mm -hmm. And I just have an easier time if somebody breaks things down into logic, logical steps for me. Mm -hmm. And it's always been a little bit of a pet peeve for me if I go to a workshop and I ask a question like, okay, so why did you pick that color for that area? When the artist would say to me, oh, I don't know, just because I felt like it. That was not a satisfying answer for me. That's when you um, say, come a little closer, do you hit them with your brush? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I would want a reason for that. And, um, and when I teach my classes, you know, I do what those two women at Marin Art School did. 
I can give everybody um, a reason for every brush stroke that I'm making yep. because yep. they're done with intention rather than just with feeling myself along. Yep. Yep. And I think in the art process, there's a place to be intuitive. And I think that's in the beginning of the process when you're conceptualizing and trying to, you know, find that muse. And mm -hmm. then, um, but if you stay in there, then, then I just feel like you, you lose power because when you can, when you can tap into that source in an intuitive way and then guide it into a place where you're becoming very deliberate and intentional in that you can become consistent. You mm -hmm. know, when I used to look at the work of Norman Rockwell, I used to ask myself, how does he consistently win? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like, Oh, I, I did a great painting and I'm not going to do another one for six years. You know, <laughs> it's like, no, I, you know, you got someone calling him on the phone. Hey, we need another great one by next week. Okay. You know, <laughs> and yeah, I agree. And, and and so yeah, I think that's brilliant that you had that experience. Um, I'm sure being a German doesn't uh, hurt you, uh, having that little German sensitivity or sensibility. Um, the uh, Picasso once said that uh, the best place to learn to draw is in Germany. Oh, ah, really? Yeah, and um, and I think it's because of that very analytical nature. Uh, that Germans have that very pre precise mm -hmm. the precision um, that them and the Austrians have. Uh, as a German, did, it, it, being raised in a place um, that was so, I would say, structured. I have friends who live in Germany, so I'm not just kind mm -hmm. of like pulling this out of the air. <laughs> um, okay. And being a highly creative person, did you feel that you you could not exist in that place, that you needed to get out? Did you ever always feel like you wanted to get out? No, not at all. Hmm. Uh, because, um, you know, I mean, I, I moved away from Germany when I was 20 eight I think 27 or 28 and it was basically just because my husband and I were going on an on an adventure nice. <laughs> you know it, we weren't planning to stay away forever it just seems like it's shaping up to be like that um you know my husband and I we both live our life in in a not preconceived way um we sort of like to keep our options open. Mm -hmm. And if something pops up, then we're both ready to jump into the opportunity with both feet. And, you know, the reason why we ended up here in the States was a rainy Sunday where I read the job ad simply because I was always curious to see what kind of jobs my bank would um, offer to the public as opposed to trying to find somebody within the bank. Mm -hmm. And so I, sh I saw this ad and it was exactly what my husband did in Germany. And I said, Oh, look at this, you know, it's for the States. You should apply. So he applied just for fun. And two months later we were moving to Chicago. What? And, <laughs> and yeah, you know, and it, for us, it was like, I don't know, going going on a vacation, you know, because we, we approached it with a curious mind and, and we, we saw it as, um, we treated it with that mindset. If we like it, we stay. If we don't like it, we leave. Nice. And we're still here. You know, after a while you just grow roots and for a while, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how long you have lived in Portugal or in other places, but maybe you can relate to that for a while you are in that twilight zone where you do love it in the new place, but you feel sort of nostalgic about, you know, your home country sure. and you're sort of undecided, you know, both countries have stuff you really love, but the other country has stuff you like better, or maybe you, there are things you don't like as much. So you're kind of torn back and forth. 
And after a couple of years, you know, you'll get over that and you, you will start to really feel um, at home in your mm-hmm. new place. But it, it took a long time. But, you know, we love it here. And I don't think we're going to go back because, um, yeah, we, we've really grown deep roots here. You know, good friends and, of course, the whole painting thing. And, you know, I think the States are a really good place to be a painter. Yeah. Um, you know, with that whole plein air movement right now, you know, however, it, however long it may last, I'm, I'm sure at some point it's going to fizzle out, but right now it's fabulous. And I, I know this one painter from Italy, he's a wonderful, wonderful watercolorist and really good at oil too. His name is Francesco Fontana. And, um, he consistently comes to the States to participate in plein air events and teach workshops and whatnot. And I asked him once, you know, I mean, he he comes from a country where there's so much art and, you know, all these ancient things. And he said, well, but there's nothing going on in regards to plein air. There's no opportunities for him. So he he has to come over here to participate in all these things. I thought that was really interesting. From from my understanding, I think Ireland is really the only place in in Europe that – does plain air i mean that that's really out you know outside of the united states um i, I mean of course people do it everywhere mm-hmm. but but f- i've talked to several artists who brought that point up um like and it's surprising because you think of something like italy i, I know in portugal like they had incredible landscapes you know mm-hmm. just gorgeous the color mm-hmm. the shapes all of it but for some reason um it seems that plain air is very much of an American thing. Well, um, I, I think there are, there are plein air painters there. And, you know, there's certainly um, a large amount of places in France and Italy, uh, especially, uh, and Portugal too, you know, where you can go on artist retreats and take mm-hmm. workshops uh, to paint on plein air. Um, but, you know, the events that we have here, you know, all the competitions and so on, you know, plein air, you know, stuff like plein air East and so on, you know, uh, I think you're right. I mean, I really only know about the, that big one that they have annually in Ireland and then a German couple who bought a painting from me. They told me about a plein air festival that is somewhere in, in north on Germany, but I assume it's more of a local thing and not an international thing. Mm. Um, because I mean, I had never heard of it, but I mean, they must exist, but I don't think you know to the extent they do exist here. Wow, every time I hear this, I'm uh, you know, business ideas go off in my head. <laughs> like, we need to organize Mine something. Too. Mine too, because you know, I, I mean, we stayed at the most charming uh, bed and breakfast on the Amalfi Coast that I mm. had found through this big coincidence because we, we actually planned this trip um, very short notice and uh, the whole Amalfi Coast was pretty much booked solid and we usually like to stay in um, Airbnbs. You know, we just rent a place somewhere uh especially since it's the three of us you know it's usually cheaper uh yeah. just to stay in an apartment or a small house and there was just nothing or at least nothing that didn't have 150 steps to climb up to get to the place <laughs> your mountain course is very vertical i'm telling you <laughs> wow. and and so so i had called this one hotel to see if they still had rooms and they're like no we're completely booked but we have our good friend Roberto and he has this charming bed and breakfast and you should give him a call so he it turned out he had a room for the three of us you know it was big enough you know it was a room in a little separate area where they could fit another bed into it and oh my god you know I mean the the views from our little terrace it was like we were suspended between the sea and the sky Wow. And, you know, Bougainvillea everywhere. And I'm looking around. And, you know, every morning, Roberto and his wife, Nada, they make this, you know, Italian-style breakfast and best coffee and cappuccino for you. And you sit out there on the terrace. And I'm like, this would be perfect for a workshop. So I'm already negotiating with him. and That's awesome. 
putting all the details together and I would love, love, love to teach a workshop there next year. It's in the making. So I can relate to you when you say, you know, you have all these business ideas popping up in your head. <laughs> I, I, I may be able, if you're interested, get you another contact. Uh, one of my students has a friend who spends um, about half the year in Italy and she mm -hmm. has a bed and breakfast out there. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to do something for the town. And so what she was envisioning was starting an amusement park for handicapped kids. Mm -hmm. um, I thought to myself, well, how in the world would that even work? You know, although the other day I saw an amusement park open up for handicapped kids. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I was like, okay, I guess they, they figured it out somehow. But Uh, with this lady, um, I remember we were talking, uh, and I suggested that, you know, maybe what you could do is have like a retreat for artists because where she was located in Italy, it was a very easy drive to all of these major places. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're, you know, um, so yeah, you know, who knows, um, if, you know. If you're interested, I could probably get you the contact information. Oh, I would love that because I'm I'm always looking for for beautiful places to take my students, and uh, I I don't like to go to a place with my students that I haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of difficult, sure. you know, to just pop up there and know where the beautiful painting spots are. So with yep. the Amalfi Coast, I've been there and we've been all over and I was taking all these mental notes and taking pictures, you know, paying attention to if there are bathrooms, if there's shade. So I, I've got it all figured out. You know, we, we ate in, in adorable, very good restaurants. Um, but to have an address, you know, that somebody else has tried out before or they know that you know which is that it's beautiful there that is definitely helpful yeah i would love to have that contact that'd be, that's cool so we'll, we'll talk about that after the the, the podcast gets you set Absolutely. up with that um when ha, have you been to italy more than this last time have you been there before oh yeah plenty of times because living in germany Sure. You go to Italy because you can drive. You know, I, I'm oh, from Berlin, wow. um, but I only, I was born in Berlin and then I lived for a couple of years as a teenager there. But for the rest of the time, we were um, in Bavaria, so close to Munich. Mm. And so, you know, you're really close in driving distance to Austria, to Switzerland, um, to Italy. You just hop in the car, drive a couple of hours, and you're there. Yeah. So, You know, my, my brother and my back then boyfriend, who's now my husband and my boyfriend, um, we we like to go windsurfing. So we would drive to Largo di Garda, go windsurfing there. You know, we would drive to Livorno, get the ferry to Sardinia to go windsurfing there. So I've been all the way down to Calabria, which is the most southern part in Italy. But I had never been in Rome because mm. when, when we still lived in Germany, you know, Germany has a lot of um, bad, drizzly, damp weather. So when you have a vacation, you typically seek out warmer climates and mm -hmm. a beach. So oftentimes when we would go on vacation, it would be a beach vacation. But now I live the beach vacation because I live in Florida Mm -hmm. two minutes from a beach that's like i don't know 50 miles long and really beautiful and warm yeah. water so for me it's a treat now to be exposed to a little bit of culture you know to cities rather than um another beach <laughs> so that's why we went to you're all rome. beached yeah. out <laughs> yeah i'm all beached out and that's that's why we went to rome this time but yeah i, I had been many times to italy you know also to uh, to, to tuscany which is one of my favorite places in the whole whole world and it's yeah. just so beautiful and the food and the people and the wine of course <laughs> <laughs> oh man ah you're not only making me hungry but making me want to travel Ay, 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 ay. Um, so, so you're working right now, you're getting ready for a show up in mm -hmm. northern New York. Um, it was in, did you say San Francisco is where you went? Yeah. 
with yeah, the after, yeah, after we lived in Chicago for a decade, we moved to San Francisco. Um, Did you feel like you were suspended between uh, the air and uh, the cliffs up there? <laughs> like with all the hills? Too. Yeah, I, I did there too. I mean, that, that was really that little bed and breakfast in Amalfi, but interesting enough, you know what? It's interesting that you say that because where we lived in San Francisco, we lived um, north of the city, just across the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, whenever we move, we rent for a year to mm-hmm. get to know the area and then we typically buy a house. Yeah. And so we had rented a house in Tiburon uh on the hill with the most fabulous view uh, out of my kitchen window i could see the east bay you know over to berkeley and then from some other rooms you know we we would look over to the city and i could even see a sliver of the golden gate bridge and so yeah we were sort of suspended there between sea and sky as well and then we bought a house in mill valley which we absolutely loved. I mean, we really did not want to leave there because it's, it's a real little town. You know, there's a real town center. People hang out in the cafes. I think it's almost a European lifestyle a little bit there. You know, a lot of people walk, a lot of people mm. ride their bicycles. Um, there was a great sense of community. Um, and our house was, again, you know, up on a hillside sort of, tucked away you know it would have been perfect for somebody in the witness protection program because (laughs) the road going up there oh my gosh it was so windy and steep and um i mean you could really hide up there and i i loved the smell you know when you opened all your windows and we were in all those you know redwoods you know it would smell so good Mm. yes we loved it there but that's really where it all started you know and i also i you know what Interesting enough, I can actually pinpoint the day when I decided I was going to be an oil painter. Hmm. So we were in Carmel, you know, just for a long weekend. And I think that was actually even before we moved to San Francisco, interesting enough. Um, I think it was for a birthday and we met up with my brother who lives in California and we met in Carmel and I walk into this gallery and I see this giant painting of a San Francisco street scene with a trolley in there and was by Ken Oster. Mm. And so I always tell people it was really him, you know, it's his fault that I became a painter because I looked at that painting and it was the most delicious painting. I loved it so much. It was so interesting because when you stood close to the painting, Mm. all you saw was really um, masculine, almost uh, crude, very dynamic, big, bold brushstrokes with lots of paint on them. Hmm. And then when you step back, um, it all gelled and you saw this atmospheric, beautiful painting. And I I, I don't know, I I just stood in front of that painting. I'm like, wow, I have to learn how to do this. And uh, yeah, and then I don't know. Later, I signed up uh, for a workshop with Ken, mm-hmm. and stayed at my brother's house, and you know, took that workshop. And I'm still grateful to him to this day. I mean, sadly, he passed away last year. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm so destroyed about it that there will never ever be another new Ken Oster painting because I love them so much, and he was just the nicest guy so patient i mean here i am a complete plein air rookie a complete oil painting rookie i'd never painted in oil before because all my um murals they were acrylic painting mm. pretty tight you know when you do those um trompe l'oeil and all those things you know you have to be a little bit tighter mm-hmm. and um so he started us out in the studio for i think for two or three days and then we had two plein air days I didn't even have an easel. So I went to Sam's club and I bought the cheapest (laughs) French easel that I could find. It was $36 and it was a pain in the butt, you know, because so I I tried to set up that easel and the screws were falling off and I'm on all fours, you know, sifting through the sand, trying (laughs) to find my screws. Then I had forgotten my palette and he gave me his and I'm so grateful that he never laughed at me. You know, he was just, oh, it's going to be okay. You're okay. You just take mine. <laughs> I would have laughed at you. <laughs> I would have laughed at people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
yeah i mean it was it was great and and he instilled um a lot of principles in me mm -hmm. that during this first workshop uh went straight over my head um because you know I, when you learn how to paint you have to be ready to hear what the instructor is saying um and a lot of the i wrote down every single word he said and mm -hmm. it was about three years later after i had started at marine art school that it all made sense you know what mm -hmm. he said and um yeah but that day in carmel in front of that painting you know that's when i knew that's what i needed to do. that's awesome and your work uh has incredible strokes like they're huge on some of them oh, um you. you know and and so everything you described when as that hit you that that experience um yeah. it was very interesting because those were the kinds of things i was noticing in your work yeah and you know also what you said before you know we were touching on um how there's always uh, a little bit of an intuitive process too which is mm -hmm. what gives the painting uh a little bit of your own personality rather than making it look like uh just copying a photograph or copying what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And he, Ken Oster, put it perfectly. And uh, to my work, it still applies to this day. You know, I, I, I have taken so many different workshops, uh, Victor, but uh, some teachers more than others have influenced me so much that I keep going back to what they taught me you know I'm, mm -hmm. I'm i'm still taking occasional workshops because i i think i would be very sad if i had the feeling i have learned everything i can learn um and also some principles you neglect and then you go to a workshop and you're like oh yeah you know i have to think about that a little bit more again but what he always said is um that a, making a painting is like a sandwich you start out with the intellect which mm -hmm. is and I think you're very much into composition and design. So, you know, he, he says that the beginning of the painting, you know, you have to take it on an intellectual level and work out your design and your composition so mm -hmm. that it's going to be interesting. And then once you've got that down, you block it in. And then comes the passion part. That's where you you get to let loose, you know, you're applying the paint, you're applying yep. the color, you know, it's more from a place deep within. But then when you're done with that, you're going back to the top of the sandwich, uh, which is the intellect again. It's almost like the intellect is the, the bun, you know, the top and yeah, the bottom, yeah. and the passion is the middle part. And then you go back and the finishing uh, touches on your painting, of course, you know, should be check where your eye goes, you know, does it move around or does it slide off the painting? You know, does everything lead to your focal point? Do you maybe have to soften some edges? Um, stuff like that. You know, you, you go back to that intellectual um, checklist and mm -hmm. check your painting and then you're done. And I think that's such a great way of putting it, you know, that you have to go a little bit back and forth. And, you know, who put it brilliantly too is um, Picasso, who said, you know, uh, learn your skill like a pro so you can, uh, or learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist, which is exactly what Picasso did. Because when you look at very old work by Picasso, it's all, it, it's very beautiful and uh, very representational. Mm -hmm. And then once he had learned and mastered all of that, you know, that's when he started breaking the rules and he started with, you know, putting the eye with, with the egos and stuff like that. <laughs> and I totally agree. And, you know, I, I always tell my students that um, I'm only there to fill their toolbox. I just want to exactly. give them all the tools, you know, teach them everything you need to learn um, to know the technical aspect of making a painting. And, you know, of course, when I say these things, um, I'm talking about the kind of art I'm making, which is uh, representational. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it might be differently with abstract art. I, I don't know enough about those, you know, that to speak for everyone. But when you, when you are a representational artist, 
um, you you have to have a certain skill set because it it's also a little bit a craft. But then, you know, once you have all those tools, you know, that's when you can start to um, put your own person into it and let your style emerge. Do you desire to make every painting have deeper meaning, tell a greater story, and be better than your last painting? Well, let me recommend a strategy to achieve just that. I recommend every artist take time to study the great master artists and illustrators and how they composed an image. Uncover their secret design formulas that makes their artwork successful. Now, if you want a little help doing that, I'll direct you to an incredible free resource at artdesignworkbook.com. That's right. I created a 177-page workbook for artists with lessons and drills that will teach you how to see the secret design formulas by master artists and illustrators. So go to artdesignworkbook.com and download your free art design workbook right now. There has to be a process where you go through, where you become self-aware and you realize what it is that you want to communicate, what it is that you're, you want to produce, and then you've, you use the tools that help you do that. It's so much easier to figure out what you want to do if you know what tools you have at your disposition. It, it, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because I think... Sadly, I think a, a great number of artists are kind of like guitar players, right? They, 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 they may be able to hear a song and play it, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of more like copying. Um, and they may be really good at playing that one instrument. But then there's another kind of musician who knows music, can write it, can read it, mm-hmm. can lead it, can conduct it. Uh, understands the instruments that are involved enough to know why they're different, how they're different, and how they mm-hmm. can relate and play together. And then mm-hmm. they become a composer of music and then also a master um, conductor. And they're orchestrating a, an orchestra, a symphony, you know. And it's just a very, very different level um, of of skill, you know. Mm-hmm. Not saying that the guy at the subway playing the guitar and singing isn't awesome, mm-hmm. but it's just a it's there's just a refineness, you know. And I think that's where we where we talk about art, and then there's fine art. There's a fineness to it, you know, mm-hmm. refining to it. Um. So, I was looking at this uh, Ken's work. Um. Because when you mentioned him, I had to go look him up. (laughs) It's funny. I didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. But I have been impressed by this guy for 20 years now. Um, I'm looking at some of his paintings. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, that's that. Like, that's the painting that I saw in this place. Yeah, yeah. Um, Where it's, it's representational. But because of his process, it's not uh, very tight. It's mm-hmm. it's really like you were saying, big strokes, and um, there's gorgeous color in there. Yeah, um, and he's a master of simplifying. You yeah, know, yeah. Most exactly. You know what I always find really interesting is, um, you know, when you read uh, like Plein Air magazine, for instance, when you read um, when you see fo- uh, photos of the painting and what the scene looked like. Mm-hmm. I always find that really fascinating, you know, to see how people simplify, how they make one thing pop out a little bit more. And he was so good at it, you know, like if there was something, if, if there were trees in the background, he would just make them in this, you know, grayish green and just make it one big shape. And everybody knows it's trees. So your yep. brain knows, oh, okay, there's trees. Without him painting a single tree limb or yep. a single leaf. And uh, for me, that makes the painting really interesting because there's stuff to discover. You know, it's not all spelled out. Exactly. I, I call it painting for the peripheral, meaning like if you look at things out, out of the corner of your eye, you still can tell what they are. Mm-hmm. You know, or it's like the... it's. I remember when I was taking drawing classes uh, when I was younger, 
my drawing master would say, you know, imagine seeing your friend across a parking lot and all you saw was their shape, their silhouette. Mm -hmm. And yet you knew it was that friend by the cadence of their movement, by the shapes that they, the combination of shapes that they were, Mm -hmm. you know, there were no details. And Mm -hmm. yet there was quote unquote, an aura. There was Mm -hmm. an, you know, an arrangement of, of elements and ingredients in such a way that only was them, you know? Yeah. And I think. It's interesting because uh, Mm -hmm. human features, um, they vary only in a minuscule way yeah you know the relationship between let's say the forehead and then eyebrows to the upper lip and then you know mouth to chin it's really tiny tiny variations so also you know the neck uh, the length of your neck you know basically the little things that make you you mm-hmm. um or even the height of people, you know, when you paint a crowd of people, mm-hmm. everybody is almost the same height. I mean, it's just really a matter of a couple of inches. Yeah. And, and I think it's just really amazing that just like you said, that you can make out somebody who's far away from you just by their gesture, you know, by the way, by their general shape and by the way they carry themselves Mm -hmm. and how how you would recognize them in a large crowd of people just just by that you know when you said about the sandwich Mm -hmm. it's interesting because he said it's intellect intuition intellect or let's say intellect passion intellect right Mm -hmm. um and i was thinking about that and i'm like and then you said about picasso and and it's weird because I almost invert it. I always think it's intuition or like passion, right? Then intellect and then passion again, but it's controlled because it's kind of like a hybrid, right? Mm-hmm. And I realize I don't think it really matters. The point is, is that you give space for the left brain to function, the right brain to function, and to have this dialogue in between mm-hmm. because it's when they overlap that that the art occurs, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's just not academic. It's just not uh, passion and intuitive, you know, ness, mm-hmm. ness. Yeah, it's neither, <laughs> yeah it's, it's neither only one thing nor the other. It, it's a combination. It's like a dance, Indeed. you know? Back yep. and forth. You know, sometimes you dance forward with your partner, sometimes backward. Yep. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Yep. It's interesting that, that you you said that for you, it's almost an inverted process. But I think you're right, actually. You've got a good point because I think um, that the spark mm-hmm. for th- to make a painting, I think that comes also from somewhere deep. So yeah, maybe that should be the plate for the sandwich. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Actually, you know, it's funny you say that because if we look at it that way, like when I teach design and composition, the first thing we we go over is what I call story. And the story is the purpose or the function of the work. You know, we always ask like, if you're going to create this thing, what is it that you want the end user to feel or experience, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a weird way, it doesn't matter if you paint trees or they could be flowers, trees, pencils, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The question is, is when someone stands in front of that image or they, or it comes into their reality, what is the experience that you want them to have? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then building it back really from almost like the finished and then building it back. And so I like that plate idea because the number one question we always ask at every step of the process is how does this decision, if you're going to start a line here and end it there and it's going to be in that diagonal, or you're going to make a brush stroke like that, or you're going to choose a value relationship like that or a temperature relationship, like how does it support the story? Mm-hmm. You know, and if you can't answer it, you don't make, you don't, you're not authorized to, to, to make that, to, you know, to make that mark. Yeah. You know. you know what I sometimes do with my students? Um, 
And they usually resist. <laughs> but I always have these great suggestions and then nobody follows through. Not just kidding. But um, when I notice that they get a little bit too tight and mm-hmm. they elaborate on everything, yep. then I ask them to write on the back of the painting what it is that made them want to paint it. Like, you know, I teach a weekly plein air class. Um, from fall throughout winter into spring because you know most of my students are snowbirds so nobody's here right now <laughs> but so when we go out to paint you know there's so many different things and they, they pick one thing and I think it's just easier um, when you write it on the back of your canvas so Absolutely. that you have a reminder for yourself what the focal point is so that you can elaborate a little bit more on that rather than on the little sandpiper here and a pelican sitting there and the clouds and whatnot. Otherwise it it gets too busy. When I was younger, we used to have a pool table and my brother Jim was really, really good at pool table, uh, pool still is. He was so good. I actually enjoyed playing him, even though I, I think I beat him once out of like 300 times we played. Um, But when we played we would play eight ball and the rule was you had to call the pocket, you know, yes. top right corner and de- and the ball had to go in there. Mm-hmm. If you didn't call it, then you were not, you, you know, you were playing a different game, which half the time, you know, it would go in a pocket that you were, you didn't intend it to go into. And so I used to love losing to my brother, Jim, mm-hmm. because he would, at the end, he would say, pick a pocket. <laughs> And I would like, and I would try to find the most difficult shot for him, but he would always make it. So oh my God. I train, you know, when I'm teaching, like, and people, we go through the story stage and, and, and I have to, you know, show a student how to move an eye. I'm like, pick a place, you know, like, it doesn't matter where it is. If you know how to control the eye, you can make it do anything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so it, so what I have them do, and you might want to encourage your students to do this, before they begin, write that statement on the back of that that one liner. You may mm-hmm. even break it down to three words, mm-hmm. okay? Um, so that way, what's beautiful is the group holds you as the artist accountable <laughs> yeah. to the muse because you because artists are really good at bullshitting people right <laughs> oh this is what i'm feeling now uh you know i had you no know, you just sucked you ruined it you messed up you know and we're not gonna you know tolerate that so um <laughs> but if you have them write it down from the beginning then this is i my students have this experience all the time someone who doesn't know that the the subject or what the experience that the artist is trying to, to do comes along and they have the experience. And I would say almost 80 to 90% of the time, they almost say word for word what the artist wrote down before they ever drew a, drew a mark. Oh, interesting. And, 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 and the confidence in the artist, it just, poof, it shoots out of the roof. Like, Holy what, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it I really encourage if you do that with them, just have them do it from the beginning Mm -hmm. and it just. Yeah, that's that's what I usually do. You know, they have to pick something and then they just write on the back of the canvas, you know, what it is, you know, that drew their attention. And and the key is to have them focus on the verb, not the noun. So to say a a piper is not, you know, a sandpiper. Ultimately that's the context and that's what they may paint is that little Mm -hmm. bird but don't let them put a noun. So it might be the, the bouncing of the way it jumps through the sand, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, Cause that's what we experience, yeah. right? The Piper just gives context to it. Right. Yeah. And you know, I, I think um, that, you know, to capture the feeling of a place, mm-hmm. you know, that comes a little bit later. So, you know, that, that comes after you learn, you know, how to draw and how to mix color and um, how to create depth and distance in a painting and atmosphere. Yeah, I, th- I think that you have to have those tools first, you know, and then later, you know, 
And I think there's not, there's no shortcut to this. I think you have to go through phases when you learn how to paint. Um, I think it's just natural. I, I would push back on you on that. I would yeah. challenge, I would challenge you on that thesis. Yeah. Because you have, you have to, you know, if you're trying to capture um, the moment, the feeling of the moment, mm -hmm. uh, it's just people have to get past that stage of copying the scene. You know, they have to know how to paint certain things before they're able to pay attention to really more to, to the feeling of it. And, you know, I, I wanted to add one thing to something that you said earlier, mm -hmm. where I will push back a little bit. Awesome. Was when you, yes. when you said, <laughs> was when you, said um, you have to think about what kind of experience you want the viewer to have. Um, I kind of gave up on that concept because... I, I usually, you know, I ha I'm in a studio co-op uh, here in Tequesta. It's the Village Art Studios, and we are 26 artists in there, and about half of those actually have working studios in there. So a lot of times I meet the people that buy my art. You know, also mm -hmm. when I do the plenary plein events, um, I usually meet the buyers of my art. And I always try to extricate why they're buying that particular painting because there's so many others they could buy. You know, I mean, uh, I think on average at these plein air events, like the Winter Park one, I mean, there's probably like 350 paintings being produced during a week. Some larger events, it's even more. So there's a lot of choices. So I, I'm always curious, why this painting? And it usually has nothing to do with the reason why I painted it. And so for me, it's really more um, uh, letting out my joy of painting, me challenging myself to capture the feeling of the moment rather than thinking, okay, you know, how, how can I make this exciting for somebody else to look at? Because, you know, the best example, I have a couple of examples actually. You know, one is, I had done this plein air painting of a little girl wearing a red lifesaver vest, climbing into a canoe. Oh, right. a red li lifesaver. Okay, I thought you said lightsaber. Like, <laughs> like, what do you mean with a lightsaber? That's awesome. I want to see that painting. <laughs> oh, that would make an interesting. Thing, actually, no, it was a, li a life vest. Yes. And the woman who who ended up buying the painting. You know, uh, she had seen the painting somewhere and then didn't even contact me until two months later. And um, the painting didn't sell for a while. And the former director of the art center where the exhibition was, she said, your title is too vicious. You have to change the title. The title of the painting was Gator Bait because it was <laughs> painted in a local um, preserve here. You know, there's alligators and everything. Yeah, like, okay. It makes sense. You're in Florida. And she's like, nobody's going to buy it with that title. <laughs> That's a you funny should, title. You oh, should sorry. title it Canoeing with Grandpa. And I'm thinking over my dead body, it's going to stay gator bait. So anyway, so the woman contacts me and, you know, and we have a conversation <laughs> while she's buying the painting. And she's like, it reminds me of my childhood. And I'm like, oh, yeah, did your parents take you um, canoeing a lot? And she's like, no, but I always wish they were. So, wow. so it was basically because she never, you know, her parents never took her canoeing and she always wanted to. That's why she had to have that painting. So you proved my point with your story. <laughs> I do? <laughs> yeah. And the person said, change it to painting with grandpa or whatever and she's like yeah i wish somebody took me canoeing when i was a kid um but uh <laughs> no, but, but what, what i'm saying is you know you you don't know what kind of emotions you're gonna stir in somebody else why did you paint yeah. that painting why did i paint that because yeah. i love the light on that little girl and mm. because i'm like a hummingbird i love red stuff <laughs> apart from the shiny things we spoke earlier uh -huh. and yeah, there were, you know, I, I, I don't know. I okay, just, so, so you love the red stuff, but w what was the feeling that you were trying to capture in that moment? Um, 
it was just this this warm summery day and this little girl you know who was about to have so much fun but when it comes down to it it's about the light for me it's usually about the light okay was there any other figure in the painting besides the little girl no okay because it was pretty uh i i I pretty much zoomed in i mean in the live scene yeah there were other people but i didn't put them in because it it was plein air so and she was moving so i really only had very little time yeah the whole thing uh so i i just threw it on the canvas and that was it but i just loved the light how you know she had blonde hair and was wet she must have been in the water before so it was really well, maybe it was shiny too. I don't know. <laughs> shiny. <laughs> no, I, 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 I feel like a crow. <laughs> it's shiny. Uh, no, it's magpies. It's mag. I'm a magpie. Okay. Um, no, but for me, it's usually when I, you know, do you know that feeling when you see something and your heart skips a beat and you're like, I gotta paint that. Yes. Um, those moments are usually triggered uh, for me by an interesting pattern light and shadow make. I would agree with you. That's, uh, I was reading a quote, something about shadows and how they draw you in and trigger emotions in people. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's really because of the shadow, it also tells us what what the light is, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So it is this beautiful relationship um, that that occurs. And I think this is why in like the Japanese, they have notons, which are just Mm -hmm. these black and white designs. Yep. And you, you you you're building your story or your artwork on that ba- that really base level of black and white it's it's yes. binary and does your image work at that level you yeah. know that simplest s- simple simple level and that's uh, how i usually work too you know i i um, before i even start painting i have this tiny little notebook and i have uh three value markers you know, a light gray, middle, and a darker. And then my fourth value is the white of the page. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I just do a note hand just to organize my thoughts in regards yep. to where light and shadow are. And sometimes um, I do a four value study. And, uh, you know, even though my notebook, I think it's four by six, um, when you leaf through it, you won't be able to recognize um, what the drawing or the value study is of because it's very abstract, Mm -hmm. but you'll see if it works or not. Indeed. Yep. Yeah. We call it carrying power. Yeah. The ability to carry that image across a room or across, you know, catch Mm -hmm. you. So that's awesome. Um, You know, your challenge against me, which you still haven't won yet, but um, <laughs> let me just say it this way. I always say, and I think it's because of my illustration background, mm-hmm. um, what's the end user, right? What are they, what do they want? But, or, or not what do they want? What is it that you want them to experience? In saying that, um, the truth of the matter is where you get the answer, that, that answer is from what it is that you're experiencing, right? And so if you're experiencing um, this moment, and ultimately you're going to communicate this visually, if someone else comes along and they don't experience that same moment, then in my opinion, personally, you fail to communicate right? That doesn't mean that they won't pick something out of the image or have some emotional connection to it or buy it or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. But, But what I really, really try to encourage people to do is feel what it is that you feel and then articulate that visually in a way that other people can experience that same moment or at least close to it. And um yeah so that statement that statement you just said i i totally agree with not the one though that you made before you know that you start the process uh thinking about the end user my, no, my I, I don't see any difference in the in the two um 
I do because um, uh, when I paint, I it's more about what grabs me. I, in that moment, I really don't think of somebody else or if they're going to like the subject matter. And then again, you know, like one time um, I have this little red car. It's, it's a beetle. Mm-hmm. And um, That's cool. there was this beetle sitting on my beetle. And <laughs> it was bright green and it looked like it was made out of metal. And it was all shiny again of course and and very iridescent and i took a picture i zoomed in took a picture and painted that and so for me um i'm like oh wow yeah look at the shadow on it and the green and look how shiny and the colors and so on i thought it was fascinating mm. other people they might look at it and they're like ew it's a beetle so you know what I mean? So so you, you just don't know what you're going going to evoke. I mean, yeah, I think That's it's true. important I think it's important to have a, a really clear thought about what you're trying to say, mm-hmm. but how it's being perceived by somebody else because these people have their own experiences. Like let's say, you know, you you, you have you're painting your pit bull. And you think he's so cute and cuddly and, and, you know, the, and the light is just right on him and whatnot, you know, somebody, and you think the painting turned out really well. Somebody else might look at that painting totally differently because they had a bad experience with a pit bull. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, uh, I don't want to think about what other people might like. I just want to, I find something that I like where that fascinates me that pulls me in and that that triggers that urge to put that onto the canvas whatever happens afterwards you know if somebody likes it or not i don't want to spend any thought on that um before i paint the painting or while i paint the painting and and you know it makes me really happy when somebody comes along then afterwards and they have to have the painting and they want to buy it and take it home and want to look at it hanging hanging on their wall every day but um that's almost like a pleasant byproduct um i I agree with you We're, we're 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 standing in the same place it's like if you looked at our shadow you couldn't tell the difference well i'm probably you could probably tell because my shadow would be a lot wider than yours probably um but the the uh but we're standing in the same place on that thought. Like, so we picked the, the same pocket. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would never encourage people as a fine artist, let me say. I would never encourage a fine artist to get up in the morning and say, okay, what am I going to paint that will sell to other mm-hmm. people, right? It's, it's yeah. not you're not paint, – you're not producing a product for someone else in that way. These people – you, you're communicating an experience that you have and that's, that's where you have to start. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so from that place, you and I are, are saying the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. You know, I, I think it's difficult to not think about what might sell, especially uh, when art is your only means of supporting you or, you know, maybe you even have a family and a couple of kids and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when you know that you have to make a living with it, I think it's very difficult, you know, to not think about what people will buy and how, how you're going to make money with it. But I, I think, um, I don't know, I, I think the, the art that looks like the artist has painted it just for their own pleasure. They just look more appealing you know, I, I, I sometimes notice that with commissions I do. Uh, I, I notice a little difference between commission paintings and paintings that I painted just because I want to paint it. Mm-hmm. Um, the commission work is usually a little bit tighter mm-hmm. um, because oftentimes I'm working maybe with a photograph that somebody provided for me. You know, just recently I did a big painting of somebody's boat. Mm-hmm. And, and my customer, you know, she, she said to me, um, 
everything has to be very exact because she had bought that boat with her husband a couple of years before and they had themselves completely restored it and renovated it and they knew every little screw and every little <laughs> thing. So it had to be very exact. So I, I sometimes with commissions, I feel like I can't be as playful as I would that's be a, with my own art. That's a great um, word, playful. But you're absolutely right, you know. I mean, it's one thing creating a work of art and having someone appreciate that and, and want to take it home versus someone coming along and saying, I'm your boss now. Yeah. Right. And, and then you got, you know, there's an expectation and there's, there's you know, some ambu- ambiguity to it, you know, like, mm-hmm. are they going to, there's a little fear, like, are they going to reject it? You know, things like that. <laughs> yeah. you know, and all that kind of- it has never happened to me. But uh, but I'm always super nervous, you know, before yeah. showing people the finished product. You know, I, I sometimes, if they want it, I send them uh, a picture of my underpainting. And, um, you know, usually people are familiar with my process of painting. You know, I've studied with a bunch of colorists and I've tried other processes, but that approach works best for me. And I find that the colors are the most luminous when I paint with that technique, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, where you basically start out with a very bright underpainting. So really pushing the color and then you go over it and you tone it down a little bit, you know, as as much as you want or you, you don't have to, but sometimes I sent them a picture of the underpainting. I did this huge commission of a painting for a brand new um, golf club. It was for the clubhouse and it's hanging. It's the centerpiece in their dining room. And I painted the golf course. You know, there's a water feature with trees reflecting and whatnot. So my sky was pink. My grass was orange. And the interior designer who had commissioned me to do that, you know, I sent her a picture and I'm like, are you ready for this? And she's like, yeah, hit me with your underpainting. <laughs> with your underpainting. <laughs> yeah. And it looks, I mean, you, you, it totally reads because the values and the temperatures um, are sort of, you know, I mean, the values are definitely correct, you know, because this mm-hmm. way I don't have to think about them anymore if I nail them with my underpainting. But, um, yeah, it's always interesting, you know, how usually they already like it, even though the colors are, you know, the not the right ones yet. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the reality. 80 to 90 percent of a, a, of a painting is not its color. You yeah. Know, it's its composition, its design, mm-hmm. it's uh, depending if you're representational, you know, that skill, uh, its values, absolutely. So, you know, once you can manage all those things and people, they can see it. And then with the color, you kind of get to have that, um, that really playful experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's like a sergeant painting. A lot of people say, oh, man, he had these brush strokes that were wild. and this. Yeah. But it doesn't mean his whole process was wild, mm-hmm. right? It mm-hmm. was like he created, it's like a child, a child without boundaries, can't be free because it doesn't know if it steps here if it will be in trouble or not Mm -hmm. so by giving it boundaries then it will play it can play to incredible degrees because it knows it's permitted to oh i love that metaphor yep that is so true you know so now you know i usually don't talk about color but i'm i'm going to talk about color with you because i you know i'm looking through your when i was looking through your paintings um i kept seeing these two uh, I don't want to say colors, but they're almost like a an energy that's coming out of the painting. And there's usually like this very high key um, lime green color, right? That's coming out of your work. Even like, like uh, uh, let me go back to your site here. Um, <clears throat> there's either like this, this li- li- like a lime greenish that's coming out or this pink that has maybe like a little bit of a peach in it right (laughs) Mm -hmm. and sometimes you even have both of them coming out and those ones i i kind of like ooh, i feel like i'm eating a flow pop (laughs) yeah it feels yummy that's a that's a great word for it um and and so therefore it's like you know to have that kind of playfulness i like that word playfulness 
uh, in your color, but within a um, the constructs of good composition, good design, great value, you know, these other sensibilities, it makes it like I can then appreciate your color, that you're in color intelligence. Thank you. And I'm not a colorist. It's something I don't really spend much time with. Mm -hmm. But when the other things are working and that pops out, um, I I just have this, it's kind of like eating at a really fine restaurant and then all of a sudden getting like this incredible dessert at the end, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. So but, why, you know, why, like, where does that you know, come from? Where does that pink and that, and that lime greeny color come from um, yellow green well you know I, I like i said i work uh mostly a la prima which means you know wet and wet mm -hmm. but it's still a layered process so you know like that that pink with that peachy color that comes uh often from um you know sometimes i start with a pink and then put a little cadmium red with white or a little bit of yellow over mm -hmm. it but you know my first layer is a thin one not necessarily thinned down so mm -hmm. that you see the white canvas through it it has enough pigment already so that it covers um but you know if i um put a little bit of mineral spirit into my paint it'll tack up pretty fast and also that that first layer it's just i'm not building up paint yet because if I started out too thickly and then uh, put another color on top, it's very easy to make mud because the next layer, you know, once I'm done with my underpainting, the next layer, it has to be applied with a different brush stroke where you mm -hmm. hold the brush more parallel to your canvas so that you deposit rather than scrubbing it in. When you're trying to scrub it in and you hold your brush at a 90 degree angle to your canvas that's usually where you pick up too much of that underpainting color and then it just turns muddy but let's say if you started out with a pink and then mix a little bit of white into a cadmium red light and then you brush that on you know with just one brush stroke wipe your brush if you picked up any of the underpainting color reload and put another brush stroke on there. That's when you get um, what's called a broken line, mm -hmm. you know, where the the uh, paint doesn't cover perfectly, but there's little speck, little open specks, and that's where you see that underpainting cover sh uh, color shine through. Nice. Um, it's just a way of of creating a certain luminosity that I have not been able to create with any other technique of painting. That's why I, why I keep coming back to it. Mm. And with the lime green, you know, I think that's the influence of Florida here because it's true, sunny true. and beautiful <laughs> every day, and and uh, everything is just in your face bright and. Um, so I found that the mo you know that the most uh uh what call it you know a green that just pops off the page is um if you take a yellow that's on the bluish side like a lemon yellow or a cadmium yellow light you know the the your cooler yellows if you mix them with a blue mm -hmm. that also has a little bit of uh, yellow in it, you know, that yeah, would, be, yeah. you know, phthalo blue or your cerulean blue, um, they lean towards the, the greenish already. So if you mix those two and maybe a tiny, tiny touch of white, you know, I'm always very careful with the use of white because it's your coolest color on your palette. And as soon as you add it to any color, you, you will not just change the value, but also the temperature and the intensity of your colors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with all the, uh, the, the, the old colors, you know, like all the cadmiums um, and, uh, oh God, I'm blanking now, you know, if, if you, all the mineral-based colors, basically, and um, heavy metal-based colors, like your cadmiums if you add white to them you will dull them mm -hmm. 
Mm. But with the modern colors, you know, all the synthetics, like the phalo and the quinacridones and so on, you know, the, uh, what is it? Is it Hansa yellow, the, uh, the artificial one? If you mix a little bit white into these, you will actually increase uh, the chroma. It will be even brighter or quinacridone. Yeah. Oh my God, you know, my favorite, my all time favorite color is quinacridone red. If you it comes out of the tube looking pretty dark, but then if you add a tiny little bit of white to it, it's the most brilliant pink you've ever seen. Mm. And I I like to wear lipstick once in a while. I just want to smear it all over my lips. It just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so so this limey green is really just a cool yellow mixed with a blue that's leaning towards uh, the yellow as well. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I was looking at your your painting of the the four boys uh, with surfboards, mm-hmm. and um, and, and I was like, here it, it was. I found it very strange because it's so pinky, and yet these four young strapping lads are going down to the water, right? <laughs> um, and it still feels very masculine, right? But it, it, it but I'm like. I would I would look at it and and, and think to myself, uh, a, a woman painted this, right? There's just some, you know, but, um, but it's probably one of my favorite paintings that I've seen. And I was just like, wow, we're totally gonna have a conversation about color because there's so much going on and it's in these little subtleties, um, and it's also coming from underneath the painting out, uh, yeah. and and so you kind of walked us through that. Um, yeah, I think I think the um, yeah I remember it now what you're referring to because uh, I think it's mostly the trees in the background where you can probably see a little bit of a pink coming through. A little bit. And yep. the, the reason um, why I painted it that way is when you have greenery that is closer to you in the shadow. You know, I I always um, differentiate between something in the shadow and something in the light i don't think in terms of dark and light too much i think more in terms of light and shadow and um so the the pink that you're referring to it's in those green shrubs and trees Mm -hmm. that are right behind uh those boys that's all in the shadow but it's pretty close to the viewer so um i wanted to to make the greens look cool, but have a certain warmth underneath. And whenever I'm trying to create that effect, I will actually put um, a dark reddish color underneath my greens because it will just warm up that bluish green a little bit that I'm going to put on top. If these trees were really far away, you would see that they would look much, much bluer than Mm -hmm. when they're a little bit closer to you. And I would probably work with a different color for the underpainting just to cool them down even more. I love the, the, the intellect that goes into layering, layering these things, you know, and the, and the science behind it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had some really good colorist teachers, you know, one, uh, of course, you know, apart from, um, uh, Darlin Davis and Jean Heafy at the Marin Art School, um, Camille Perswadic. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. Do you desire to make every painting have deeper meaning, tell a greater story, and be better than your last painting? Well, let me recommend a strategy to achieve just that. I recommend every artist take time to study the great master artists and illustrators and how they composed an image uncover their secret design formulas that makes their artwork successful. Now, if you want a little help doing that, I'll direct you to an incredible free resource at artdesignworkbook.com and download your free art design workbook right now. Besides Ken Oster, I think she's also one of my all-time favorite artists. She's got beautiful color. And uh, when I lived in San Francisco, um, I would sometimes on Mondays, drive up to Petaluma where she would would be teaching her Monday plein air class Mondays with Camille 
And she taught me so much about color as well. And she works with this colorist approach. You know, she has studied with um, Henry Henschel at the Cape Cod School of Art, mm-hmm. and which dates all the way back to Hawthorne. And I, I just love these paintings, you know, the, the luminosity of the color. And, you know, it's some people, they don't like stuff that is too bright. And I think I've become a little bit more moderate with my color. I think I used to be even brighter. Mm. But I realized for myself um, that you also need areas in your painting where the eye can rest. Yeah. You know, if you have crazy color everywhere, um, it's not something I would want to hang in my house because I think it would make me antsy. Yep. Well, <laughs> but, it's, a, it's a voice and you want it to sing. Right. Not so you scream. also need some, some neutrals. You know, if you have some neutrals yep. in your painting, you can make uh, the brights stand out even more. You know, it's all about contrast. You know, let's say, you know, I am painting a red tomato and I, I want this tomato to have maximum punch. You know, I would think about what do I want to surround it in regards to value, but also saturation and color so that it has the most punch. So I'd probably put something greenish around it because it's the complementary color to red. Possibly. So yeah, I, I, guess I, I guess I do think about these things more and more. Um, I recently took a workshop with Ken DeVord and I just loved it because um, uh, the the things he he was talking to me about they were so individualized to my level. You know, mm. we never talked about color mixing or or any of these things, but it was more about it was very conceptual and how to take artistic liberties to make mm-hmm. the painting even better. You know, basically mm. going back to the top of the sandwich. <laughs> you know, don't feel like don't feel like you have to be a slave to your setup, to your photograph, to your landscape, and just do stuff to make it the best you can make it. I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one thing I don't know if you're looking at this painting uh, with the guys with the uh, surfboards, um, but you know, when you're talking about how do you make you know like if you were going to make it punch, you'd put the green next to the red and things like mm-hmm. that. Um, you have this beautiful, high saturated blue, low value uh, blue in the sky, right? And mm-hmm. when I'm looking at it on my screen, I cover it up with my entire hand and then I just give it a minute. And what happens is all of that pinky, uh, peachy color begins to fade out of the, uh, out of the characters. It's still there. you got a mm-hmm. high pink in the back there. Um, but it, all of a sudden the painting goes and kind of just like it, it, its power drains a little. Yeah. And, then, and then when I release it and I, and I let that blue come back into my eye, mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's like it, it activates the oranges yes. inside that area that just make it now like feel like the sun, the heat, it, it, you know, it just increases the temperature. And um, yeah, I think it's also, it, it balances the painting a little bit. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. You know, there's really not much in that painting, you know, it's trees in the background, a path and those four surf dudes. <laughs> and if you, if you cover that area in that corner, um, well, your eye only goes to the surface, but it stops moving around the painting. Yeah, and I think what it also does is um, it breaks up the trees, right, and enough, yeah. and it gives us enough context. Like, it makes us feel like they're walking down to the shore. Yeah, right? and if also you- know, knowing that, that you're so heavily into design and composition, um, I always try to incorporate some lines somehow – or some things that basically are almost like a little arrow pointing yep. towards my focal point. So when you look at the blue and you see it more like an abstract shape rather than, you know, the trees that are broken up, then you see that it's actually pointing right down at those boys with the surfboards. Yeah. It connects you to the surfboards. And then as your eye goes through curves over towards the end, it brings us to where the, 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 beach would be like you feel like they're close 
if you cover it up, they kind of it looks like a bunch of boys who got lost in the woods. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. You're like, why are they dragging this horse? They know what are they doing there? <laughs> You're gonna use them for firewood. Um, but oh, the blues cool. that you have in the path, right, with the little dappled shadows, mm-hmm. I love that because they're not horizontal. They're on this slight angle, right? Mm-hmm. That again makes us. It, it allows us to travel this image at, at at a pace that's very relaxing, fun. Like, but it's but it's taking us to where we need to go, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. But the the way you have the brush mo- uh, strokes, it, it's done in a certain way in a certain uh, cadence that makes us, at least for me, it makes me feel the pace of their walking, right? Mm. Like. And it gives me this nice little, like I'm actually dancing in my seat right now. Like there's, it, it's this little nice uh, rhythm, like, ta, 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 you know. And then, oh, it's awesome to get that feedback. You know, I, I hardly ever get feedback like that, you know, that is so detailed about, you know, how, what, what it triggers in you, you know, how you see it. Yeah. And, how you feel when you look at it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and then there's one other part to it that I really like um, is actually the the layout of the surfboards themselves, right? There's this beautiful arc that curves through them, right? And then you mm-hmm. have it mimicked into three boys in the back. Um, you kind of feel like that guy in the front is the little leader. Like he's like, <laughs> um, <laughs> but having the, those curves, those two major curves there, and then that strong diagonal and the surfboard in the back, um, it, it creates this nice, again, like the the walking rhythm, like tha, tha, huh, tha, mm-hmm. tha, huh, right? Like, mm-hmm. like there's this like they're not moving slow, but they're also not running, right? But it's just yeah, this nice pace by the strides they're taking. Yeah, maybe yeah. But even if you cover it up, you'd still kind of feel it. Like, like if you cover up to maybe their knees or even like even up to their thighs you still kind of feel it in the in the movement of the surfboards and the way that you have them pacing so you yeah, know interesting yeah so what that tells me is i know you didn't sit there and and, and you know and plan all that out right um most great artists are very intuitive about these things. Mm -hmm. There is a way to become very intentional about it, but that takes training. But you, you are absorbing the energy in that moment. And like you said, it's like dancing, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're kind of being led. So, you know, Oh, I I need to move to the left. I need to move to the right. I need to step forward and back. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you're dancing in this moment, you know, it might be the light that you're dancing with, whatever it is that you're actually touching. Um, you do have a sensitivity that it's actually coming out in a beautiful cadence uh, in, in your work. And you know, with that particular painting, uh, the photograph I worked with, it was a photograph I took uh, last summer when I was visiting my brother who lives in San Juan Capistrano in California. And we went, uh, we went to the beach and you have to walk down on this, um, this path. Um, it's, I think it's Dana Point. And we were ah, actually I was in the, okay. mm-hmm. We were coming back from the beach and, I, and there was this really dark green hedge and there's those four guys walking down. And I'm like, oh, you know, that was one of those moments, you know, where, like I said before, where my heart just skips a beat and I'm like, there goes my painting. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter, you know, she knows so well what triggers me in the meantime. She's like, mom, take the picture. And so <laughs> I did. And, and the screen. <laughs> <laughs> there's your painting and it turned out in the photograph um the the four boys they were just perfect i mean i i literally only had to paint them the way they were in my photograph the mm-hmm. stuff i changed around a little bit you know they were really walking on um asphalt and this painting was painted for the show up in fisher's island mm-hmm. so i had to make it look more like a path like a sandy path and so the piece of sky up there, you know, that was not in the actual picture. That was something 
there was a conscious choice, you know, I, I made later also that little shadow on the path, that purpley shadow on the right, mm-hmm. you know, that was also a conscious choice to put that shadow there, even though it wasn't there just to keep the eye from leaving the painting on the path because my path would lead straight out of the painting. So putting a little shadow there is okay. Ah, nice. Dropping the eye and then it follows, you know, the little light on the grass and goes back up to the surface. So yeah. those are all things I think about when I think I'm done with the painting. Then I take a break and then with a fresh eye, look at the painting uh, sometimes it helps to take a picture with your iPhone, mm-hmm. take a picture of the painting, <laughs> look at it on your little screen, because again, then you see the big shapes rather than the little details and stuff will pop up. Or, you know, if you take a mirror mirror and stand backwards to your painting, look at it through the mirror, put it upside down, whatever helps you look at it with a fresh eye. And that's where usually those, those ideas and decisions um, crop up to really finish the painting on average, I say about 12 times that I'm done with the painting. <laughs> and then I'm like, Oh, hold on. Just there's a little thing here. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I do that about 12 times. Well, that's cool. It's good that you know, uh, your, your rhythm, your ways. Um, wow. Yeah. I'm just looking over your work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess. Oh, wait. You had a painting in here that um, I saw was of a fountain, and I was curious if that was in Forsyth Park. If 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 you did any painting, yes, it was. Was it? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, oh, here it is. Yes. Um, okay. That's in the art archives, right? The was it recently sold stuff? I- <clears throat> Yeah. 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 Um, and and I was I was on my phone. I was sw- sw- um, fl- flicking through it, so I didn't know. Let me put a. Oh yeah, it does say Foresight Park in yeah. Savannah. But I saw that, and I'm like, I know that energy. <laughs> and then uh, um, is that where you live? Uh, yeah, I went to. That's where I went to school. Um, and so I spent oh, probably about eight Stad? years in Georgia, in Savannah. Did yeah. you go to Stad? Yeah, yeah, many many moons ago. Um. Actually, right before we talked, I, I was just on the phone with them because I have to get my transcripts. Um, oh. but yeah, that was, you know, that was on a workshop I taught last year in Savannah. Oh, my God, that was so much fun. I had, mm. I had rented uh, this big old 200-year-old house. Oh, it was so beautiful and took six students um, to spend the week there. And when I teach... Um, I'm not one of those teachers who take people on a trip and then I paint all week and they're basically left to their own devices. <laughs> I do a demo here and there, but then I stop painting and I'm only busy with them, helping them with their paintings, walking around the whole time. You know, I usually get the demo um, out of my system in the morning or sometimes I don't uh, sometimes I don't do a demo, but a little lecture instead, like color mixing, values, no tans, composition. Yep. I usually pick one topic. So this painting, the Forsyth Fountain, was literally only one of two paintings I painted that week after the workshop was over. I stayed in the morning before I drove back home mm. uh, because that's where my student had paint, students had painted the day before, and I was just itching to paint that fountain. <laughs> too. So I actually, I actually went back there to paint it. The other one... That's the right. Pink house. The pink house. Yeah, that was a yeah. demo I did the first day when it was I know rainy. The pink house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was rainy that day, so there was not much light and shadow. So I was looking for something else that has some other light source, and I thought it looked interesting with um, the light in the entrance there. I'll tell you a very personal story, <laughs> and yes. I probably shouldn't say this. Okay. No, I'm curious. Do tell. Uh, Let's just say I waited for a very, very long time before I experienced certain things in life. <laughs> and the the magic uh, experience that I had with um, someone who used to work there. So the pink house is a very oh. 
dear uh, place in my heart. Oh, um, that's awesome. Yeah, it was Savannah. I, I miss it. I, I, I miss that place tremendously. Yeah, um, it seems yeah. like a really cool city. You know, just the mix of history and, you know, all those fountains. And, you know, I mean, you discover something around every corner. Yeah. Um, I really loved it too. You know, one, one spot that's also on my list where I would love to go paint is um, Charleston. Mm. But uh, it's not on the horizon yet. You know, I started to travel quite a bit with my paintbrushes since my husband and I became empty nesters. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes you know, I, I talk to old friends, you know, friends that I've made when we all became moms and, you know, so we're all sort of in the same phase of our life, you know, that our kids mm -hmm. have gone off to college and they're all like, Oh my gosh, I miss my kids so much. I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'll edit this part out. <laughs> you know, I'm going to Italy to paint. I go to Bermuda. I was in Brooklyn and New York to paint. You know, I'm all over the place. I'm teaching all these workshops, you know, sometimes I feel like, Oh my God, you know, should I just pretend that I'm so sad or is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> should I pretend? Hell no. <laughs> that's that's all <laughs> should i pretend i'm so sorry you know never never pretend enjoy <laughs> live it up love it up yeah um, i am i am and you know what just the the fact that my daughter is very happy at her school and you know doing the thing she does makes me happy and makes me relax so that i can just do my own art you know it'd be different yeah. if she would be in a bad spot or something you know of course she's my priority but she's happy so i'm happy i'm doing my thing and you know she she's trying to be my helper next year when i'm gonna do that workshop on the amalfi coast so. nice, nice. she's like yeah mom i'll help you yeah just be careful i carry stuff <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah i'm gonna go down and talk to all the young italian men um and just find <laughs> out the best places to go uh, you know i'm doing recon research mom yeah it's, um, <laughs> Market, market research, field studies, you know, hearing it from the horse's mouth where all the good spots are, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's cool. Um, uh, you know, ha have you ever painted in the Key West? Yes. Cool. Uh, let me see. I, I'm not sure. Do I have Key West? Uh, well, you know what? Not Key West, but I was in the Keys... Um, in February, I'm friends oh, wow. with a very good painter. Uh, she lives in Tavernier, which is right between Key Largo and Isla Morada. So in the, you know, a little bit closer to the mainland. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had invited me to be part of a fundraiser uh, for artists that are still suffering in the aftermath of Irma. Mm. Uh, Nobody's talking about Irma anymore because, of course, you know, they cleaned up the area, but it still has an impact. You know, the uh, hotel industry is still suffering. You know, there was uh, Hawks Key is still closed. You know, there was a beautiful big hotel. They had to let everyone go because mm. uh, it'll take them about one to two years to, you know, rebuild. And so since the hotel industry isn't doing so well, the artists aren't doing so well because there's less tourists and less people to sell uh, art to because the locals, you know, they also had to use resources to rebuild um, their houses and yeah. replace damaged property. And so, so we, um, Kathleen and, me and Michelle held and I, and for a day there was a fourth painter, a uh, fifth painter, Linda Apriletti, we were painting all week our little hearts out and then um, a local gallery actually put on a show for us. They did a beautiful reception. Uh, it's called Our Place in Paradise and, um, you know, sold paintings. Then 50% of the proceeds actually went to artists who are still suffering there. And uh, let me see if I have any of those 
painting. There was a really funny one actually that I did of a of a shower head. There was that person who had an outdoor shower, and I just couldn't resist. Was that the person who was taking the shower? Yeah, <laughs> no. Okay. You know I I don't think I put any of the of those paintings on here for some reason. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but that was that was fabulous down there. The little that pink house that's in the outdoors, the Hope Town Tangle, that was from a trip recently to uh, the Bahamas. Mm. And I also went with Kathleen Denis and Michelle Hall to the Bahamas uh, last fall, which was so much fun to paint there. And then um, there's a bunch of paintings from Winter Park. You know, I always get invited for the Winter Park paint out. Mm-hmm. And so you see all my red shiny things there, you know, the red Harley that was painted. That was a plein air painting, actually. There was a guy who actually waited for me for three hours to paint his motorcycle. Oh, that's cool. And then while I was painting that motorcycle, I was, I was uh, joking around with these two guys who had come back from a kayak trip and they were waiting for their bus to take them back to where the kayaks start you know you just go down river and then they pick you up and drive you back and so they were sort of watching part of the process of that harley coming together and they really loved it and they're like hey how how do you like to paint a red old fire truck and it turned out they were fire firefighters ah, very cool yeah, and I they invited the me to paint their 1972 imperial you know, which is a really old uh, vintage fire truck. Mm-hmm. So I talked to the organizers, you know, there was at the Vikaiva paint out, which is all nature and lily pads and so on. And I'm like, would it be weird if I painted, you know, apart from the Harley, a fire truck? <laughs> and they're like, no, no, go right ahead, paint whatever you want. So I was sitting in the courtyard of that fire station for four hours painting that uh, fire truck. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing about the plein air paintings. Every single one has a story and I will never forget it. And when I look at these paintings, all the memories come back because, you know, it's different than when you just go visit a place. You know, you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, that's nice. You know, what's next? But when you paint there, you sit for um, on average anywhere between two and a half to four hours, depending yep. on the size of the painting and you know how involved the drawing and everything is but you soak it all up exactly you you hear the birds you smell the smells you feel the wind you know you feel the sun or rain Mm. or bugs you soak it up and the memories for some reason seem to stick better (laughs) yeah you're well you're present you know yes that's exactly what it is you're present you're not thinking about anything else you know which is actually one of the reasons why I love painting so much, it helps me being completely in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's really pretty much the, the only activity where I experience that, that I'm not thinking about anything else. And I, I don't feel time passing. It just stops. Mm. And, you know, sometimes I'm painting in the studio and my husband comes home and I'll be, I'll be like, I'll be done in five minutes. And he usually just goes and starts dinner because he knows it's going to be. Who knows how long. Because I, I literally don't feel that more than five minutes are passing. And yeah, it's just, it's nice because um, painting is just a way for me to um, uh, not think about all the bad stuff that's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. And so, because sometimes, you know, I, I guess as artists, we have a certain sensitivity and certain things just really, they crawl right under my skin and then it simmers there and makes me mad or sad or whatever. And, um, you know, one example was actually, uh, let me see if I have that painting of that Buddha in here. I painted oh, yeah. the little green it's Buddha. Still alive. There's that Buddha. Yeah. That was actually painted February 15th of this year. February mm. 14th was that day when so many kids got shot at that school here in Florida. Mm. 
and uh, it, um, yeah, and for the next day, you know, we had planned a paint out. You know, I belong to Plein Air Palm Beach, which is this huge group of um, painters here in um, Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. And we have meetups where we all go and paint together. And, you know, that day we had a meetup in somebody's private garden that invited us to come and paint. That's and cool. in the morning, I didn't even feel like going because... The painting, you know, it, it felt so not important in the light of what's going on, you know, of, you know, kids shooting kids in school. And I was just super aggravated and sad. And then I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go anyways. And so I showed up in that garden. A friend of mine had told me, you have to walk through the whole garden. And she was right. I mean, it was like this enchanted garden with so many things to see. But there was this little fountain with that green Buddha head. And, of course, it was shiny because, you know, there was water running down. And I spent an hour and a half in peace. Mm. You know, that's, it's called peace because it helped me to just settle down a little bit and just not think about the bad stuff for a little while. That's beautiful. It's, um, you know, it, I agree with you. It's... it's um you know, I, I know when we first started, we were like, we're not going to talk about politics. Um, but I'll tell you a little, like I, when it comes to like politics, because I think it puts a lot of, of that negativity in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, I only come out of my cave maybe once a month and allow myself a few hours to kind of absorb what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go back in. Mm -hmm. Um but I spent maybe like a decade where I was like obsessed with it, you know, listening to all the shows and this and that. Da, 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 da. And at the end, I, I just felt like so yucky <laughs> that I just made the decision a few years back that enough is enough. And I'm just going to focus on what my work is to be done on this earth, which is to, get out my uh to get out the the message about design and composition and work with artists mm -hmm. um and so you know when you're in your work um or you know you're in that zone there's that place of where where things feel like you said peace you know there's um a wholeness and like a completeness and you feel healthy and, and safe and um, and I think that's a good place to paint out of because once you produce artwork that has that stillness, like that's in a lot of your work, mm -hmm. um, you know, I always say, we're, you know, the vision is to flood the world in beauty. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one of the great things that artists get to do. You know, we're just not, it's not actually finding beautiful things that work than copying to, to, to show other people, but it's actually like finding a moment, be it in a still life, a figure, a landscape, abstract, whatever it is, but to find that moment, commune with that moment, have that, that centered peace and out of that place, paint, cook, dance, mu do music, mm -hmm. read to your children, make love whatever it is right mm -hmm. out of that place and, and 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 then 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 your life becomes a work of art you know mm -hmm. um and and so i'm it's cool that you know how to get into it you know yeah like, fine. but I, you know i i think you're already a step ahead of me you know when you made that decision that you're just not gonna follow politics you know on a uh regular basis you know like on a everyday basis you know mm -hmm. i'm i'm still torn a little bit back and forth between well but i have to be informed so that yep. i can make informed <laughs> choices because i mean the only way i have to change things is by going to vote yep. and even though i sound like a german tourist i also have the <laughs> that i get to vote <laughs> So, so I, I feel like I have to know a little bit about stuff, but right now uh, in the cli in the political climate we're having, I I get easily aggravated. Sure. And 
Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, when it, you know, what it boils down to is we only have this one life. We only have this moment right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think slowly but surely I'm coming to the conclusion that I don't want anybody to poison my moment that I'm having right now. Because mm -hmm. I don't know how many more moments there will be so I don't want to think about stuff, you know, that might happen or that just happened uh, yeah. yesterday again. Um, it's difficult to do, but, you know, the, the painting definitely helps with the being in the moment. And I, I just love to surround myself also with like-minded people, you know, be it other painters or my students because they, they get it you know, they're all sort of like that. And it's just very, um, almost healing, you know, being with them and, um, spending a couple of hours looking at whatever it is we're looking at and, you know, putting it down on the canvas. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think with, you know, the voting, the politics, I think what happens is there's a strange blend of it's entertaining even if it upsets us. It's kind of like watching a horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't watch horror movies. <laughs> I'm, uh, my my ex-wife loves horror movies, but I think probably one of the reasons why we didn't make it in the end was because in 10 years, I never watched one with her. Um, <laughs> it's like, can you yeah. go watch those with your cousins? I'm not watching a horror yeah, movie. No, I, don't I like can't watch it either. You know, for the same reason, it sticks with me. It yeah. makes me feel so icky. And and then I'm thinking, I, you know, because you and I, I mean, we're very visual people, and I just can't get those horrible images out of my mind. So the only horror movie that I actually like <laughs> and that I will watch over and over is The Shining. I think Jack Nicholson is so ah, good. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> but other than that, no. Well, you yeah. know what's strange about that one? I find it far more creative than haunting like yeah. there's something about you know the, the creativity behind it the, the the ideas behind that um but you know like these movies where people are just being sawed up and this and that you know and for yes. people who are highly sensitive like we are that's i don't think people get how damaging it is to us like we we can visualize all kinds of things and like you said you can't it's it's so hard to get it out uh to get it out of you yeah yeah and, yeah no you know when i um want to be entertained you know i i find it very difficult to um understand how you can get joy out of watching all that horrible stuff you know how that can enter entertain you um it's a I german just, word what do you mean what's huh? the german word that means you get uh joy out of watching other people get pain freuden knocking or something like schadenfreude. that schadenfreude schadenfreude <laughs> how do you say it schadenfreude yeah well, there it is yeah yeah no it's i just can't relate to something like that you know when i want to be entertained i either need somebody to make me laugh or make me think or show me something beautiful <laughs> Pretty you know it's interesting you say that because my favorite kind of movies uh i'm 42 and i feel weird saying this but are chick flicks you know i love romantic comedies um and i never understood why i i, I sometimes tried to figure out I'm like why do i do this like oh, i'll watch them by myself you know mm -hmm. um but I think it's for what you just said. It, it's it's entertaining, but there's ultimately there's comedy, right? Is usually mm -hmm. a subtle kind of comedy. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's just a beautiful story. There's a you know yeah. a moment where they fight and then they make up, but you know, it, it is predictable. But if it's but if it can make me laugh a couple times, mm -hmm. make me think and hope, you know, I hope it's romantic, and then to have just that sense of beauty throughout, like, ah, oh, that was a beautiful story. That was a beautiful thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the combination of all that, it's always my go-to movie, you know? And then after that, let's watch some, uh, some uh, you know, action. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so have you watched The Book Club then? The Book Club? Yeah, um, that no. was the latest chick flick. Oh, really? Diane <laughs> Keaton and... Um, 
god what's her name I'm blanking on the other names it was really funny <laughs> chick flick <laughs> book club and if I... you want action then you have to go see jurassic world oh the new one yeah we went last night because we're all still jet lagged oh, okay. and we had to find something that would keep us up longer because That's right now point. we just want to go to bed at 7 30 but then we wake up at four and so we're like, okay, you know, we're going to go watch Jurassic World. And oh my God, it was, you know, I it was, was good. on the edge of my seat the entire time, even though I'm not even usually into dinosaur movies or any of that, but it was, it was really good. So you can go and That's see awesome. It. I'll take my son to go see that. Yes. Um, I'm going to leave you with this. I want you to go look at this show. It's called Two Greedy Italians. Okay. Okay. I absolutely love this show and um, you can watch it on YouTube. I think that's the only place I've ever watched it. Okay. Um, but it's about this, this, this older chef and one of, and I think it's like an apprentice of his, but, but they're both older. Right. Mm -hmm. And they've spent 20 years, you know, and they're very close friends and they, you know, but he was, uh, I think he, 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 they were both from Italy. They moved to London, I think. Maybe it was France, London. But it became, he's this famous chef. And what they do is together is they go back to Italy mm -hmm. after, dec you know, 20 years or whatever. And they go through the, the, the towns and the cultures and they're always making food and they're talking about the food and the culture. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think the way that you were pronouncing the words – um the the joy that you have when you talk about italy i think you would absolutely love this show oh, sure. two greedy italians I two greedy italians it. now one thing about you know italians that we think of is that they're highly sexual people right so don't be shocked that these are two italian dudes <laughs> <laughs> and they have like, this amazing banter with each other um, like I think in one of the shows, the guy even like, you know, hired an escort for his old friend. It was his <laughs> birthday or something. Um, they didn't do anything, but like, but you know, cause he's a gentleman, but like, but it, it's just funny. It, the, 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 the camaraderie between these two guys and the stuff they talk about with such passion, if it's wine or women or food or culture or heritage or travel or whatever, it's just, it's just all passion, you know? extremely intelligent and mm -hmm. and it just feels so authentic and and uh, i think you'll just absolutely love it oh great no i'll, I'll check it out and then i will want to go back even more you know I just, <laughs> I just love the italians you know i i think it would be nice you know down the road just to have a place there i don't know renovate an old barn have an artist retreat, you know, yeah. I have people come visit and paint, you know, and I don't know, sit in the middle of the vineyard stomping grapes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, I love that dream. Um, I was just telling someone today, almost word for word, what you just said, you know, but instead of Italy, it would be Portugal. Like, mm -hmm. but the same thing, like, you know, my goal at some point here, by the time I, well, I know the time, by the time I, my son turns 12, um, I like to buy a farm with some um, outbuildings. Mm -hmm. And um, when I used to live in a city, I had a, a carpenter and he had two sons and, and his sons never really wanted to learn his trade. Mm -hmm. And he learned his trade from his dad. And so I said, uh, oh, wow. Ray, when my son turns 12, you're going to be his, his, his master carpenter, right? And you're going to teach him um, how this is done. Mm -hmm. And so my, in my mind, I'm like, okay, by the time he's 12, I have to have a farm where he can have uh, buildings to work on. Um, and then my daughter, I call her my architect and my son's my builder. So uh, she'll design the spaces and then they'll build it, you know? Oh, and, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. So that that's like... I don't really know how I'm going to necessarily pull this off, but I, I got, you know, at least four to five more years before, you know, <laughs> my, my, oh, my deadline. 
Put it out to the universe. And Absolutely. It happens. Trust that it happens. <laughs> so it sounds like a lot of us have this very similar kind of dream, you know, where we provide a, a place for like an artist retreat. And um, so, okay, yeah, it's, it's going out. It's going out. <laughs> um, Mano, did I say it right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Mano. Um, I think you should do a, a show called Mano Mondays, right? <laughs> Mano Days. Um, it was awesome talking with you. I Likewise. Thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I learned so much. Um, you gave such tremendous, wonderful stories. Um, and so how can people connect with you? Um, I have a website. Mm -hmm. And on the website, there will also be a link. You know, you can send me a message and my phone number is on there too. So the website is www manonsander.com which is m a n o n s a n d e r.com um or you can shoot me an email at manondesigns at comcast.net which is m a n o n d e s i g n s at comcast.net or you can simply call me at 415-606-7685. Or you can also find me um, on Facebook or Instagram. If you just put Manon Sander in there, uh, you can find me. So lots of ways to connect with me. And if you're spending time suspended between the sea and the sky, smoke signals work very well. That works really well. <laughs> you can send me a homing pi pigeon. Oh, yes, a homing <laughs> pigeon. That's perfect. <laughs> Blot out the song. Uh, <laughs> a homing <laughs> pigeon. Um, that's awesome. And I'll add that stuff to the uh, show notes so people can just click on and, and go over and check out your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, great. Awesome. Have a great one. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. You know, the, the pleasure was entirely mine. You know, I, I loved... Um, the things you said, your input, your perspective. Um, I can't believe we spent two and a half hours together. It goes by so fast, right? Yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Victor. It was really nice talking with you, and I hope that your listeners will enjoy this podcast. Awesome. Bye. Bye. Do you desire to make every painting have deeper meaning? tell a greater story and be better than your last painting? Well, let me recommend a strategy to achieve just that. I recommend every artist take time to study the great master artists and illustrators and how they composed an image. Uncover their secret design formulas that makes their artwork successful. Now, if you want a little help doing that, I'll direct you to an incredible free resource at Art design workbook.com that's right i created a 177 page workbook for artists with lessons and drills that will teach you how to see the secret design formulas by master artists and illustrators so go to art design workbook.com and download your free art design workbook right now